Well, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to our special webinar this evening, uh, Much To Do About Pain. My name is Julie McCrossan and it's my enormous pleasure uh, to be your host this evening. This is a community forum about pain and pain management and it's hosted by Walper Jewish Hospital and Friends of Walper and also in partnership this evening with the Australian Pain Management Association. I'd like to begin by acknowledging that we're on Aboriginal land and to pay our respects to elders past and present through the magic of Zoom. I'm broadcasting to you this evening uh, from Wellington, New South Wales, about five hours west of Sydney, the land of the Wiradjuri people. And as our sun goes down, you may hear a few cockatoos squawking in the background. Our purpose tonight is to provide you with information about pain and pain management and to discuss the sort of approach to help and where you can find it uh, that is likely to give you the best chance of effective pain management. Uh, we also will endeavour to answer your questions. Um, our format tonight is a panel discussion. We have four guests whom you'll meet shortly. Uh, we also uh, will have a poll so we can learn a little bit about you and we will finish on time at 9pm. Just as a few more people are joining us, a, a little bit of quick housekeeping. We can't see and hear you at home. Your way of interacting with us and, and bringing questions to us is through the Q&A. If you see that down on the bottom of your screen, if you click there, you can type it in. And I might say that quite a number of you have sent questions already. So Q&A is the way to talk to us. Uh, chat is just for the people who are on the panel. And the way we will manage the questions is that Dr. Alan Schell, a general practitioner and a, an esteemed friend of Walper Jewish Hospital, will be monitoring your questions. And I will go to him at regular intervals during the evening and ask him for a sense of the overall themes that are coming and to share with us some of the questions. Now, obviously we won't be able to answer all the questions, but Alan does his best to make sure that the key themes are visited uh, in our question time. The other thing to say is that we can't give individual clinical advice uh, to individuals who, who send questions to us, but what we can do is to give you all important background and general information that you will be able to discuss uh, with your clinicians, your general practitioner, other doctors and allied health that you may be, allied health people that you may be dealing with. And we do welcome anonymous questions if you wish. Um, so, with no more ado, it gives me pleasure to introduce Dr. Alan Schell, and he will uh, introduce us to our very special guest. Good evening, Alan. Good evening, Julie, and thank you for hosting and being our very competent Julie McCrossan. And thank you all to the panel who we'll shortly meet. Uh, tonight uh, is our first event, the wellbeing event for the year. We have a number planned, uh, and I'll talk about them at the end of the meeting. First one tonight is much to do about pain. And as is uh, usual, we do have an invited support and um, I guess an important group, the Australian Pain Management Association as a, as a so-called guest, not sponsor, but, but as a guest here. And so I'm going to introduce Jessica Taylor, who's the CEO of Australian Pain Management Association. Uh, this was established in 2009 as a national consumer health promotion charity for individuals with persistent pain for themselves and of course to assist their families. So I'll introduce Jessica Taylor to let us know about Australian Pain Management Association. Thank you. Hello, thank you, Alan, and thank you, Julie, and welcome everyone to tonight's webinar. It is our absolute pleasure to be here tonight. Pain affects so many people across Australia and it is a part of our business. We're the peak consumer body for people that live with pain. And, and as Alan said, we did establish in 2009 because the founders saw a gap in service who had, they had gone through a pain management clinic themselves and wondered what was next. And so APMA started in the early days of 2009 in local communities. Growing to 2021, we're a much bigger organisation and uh, we're here and we're passionate about sharing the consumer story uh, of people that live with chronic pain. And we know and understand the importance of connection. We know and understand how isolating it can be when you do live with chronic pain. 
And so bridging that gap of peer connection, uh, connection with the community, we offer a range of services and they are free to the community. So we have a pain link helpline where we have accredited pain uh, link and health mental health guides that are there to talk through anything. If pain's talking, we're here to listen. We also have local community groups in a number of locations across Australia, and they're there to connect with each other. They might be uh, after a pain management clinic. You might be socially prescribed to attend one of our services and our pain support groups. And it's a chance to share information, share what works for you or what doesn't work for you in a safe environment with people who get it because we understand that important, the importance of that connection. We have loads of resources and uh, would really invite you to go over to our pain management website, painmanagement.org.au. We offer training and education to people that live with chronic pain and also to health professionals who uh, would like some greater understanding around pain, pain management and how they can help their patients. So we are really keen to hear of stories. If you would like to share your story with us uh, and help us influence at state or, or federal levels uh, where we, where, when and where we do that, we'd love to connect with you and uh, please do reach out. And thanks again to this organisation uh, and, and everyone that has shown up tonight. Uh, for those that live with chronic pain, it can be tricky to, um, to show up. So I congratulate you all for, for being here. And to the health professionals, thank you for being interested in chronic pain. Thank you so much, Jessica. And this is the way uh, deaf sign clapping occurs. And so we're clapping across uh, Australia, tuning in tonight. Um, welcome, if you've just joined us. I'm Julie McCross and our host this evening. And we do understand that we do have uh, people joining us from all manner of locations. Just before I introduce our panel and we get going on um, talking about pain management and answering some of your questions, uh, just a, a, a quick poll. And, and just before I go to the poll, I do want to say to you, the way to send your questions to us is through the Q&A button. If you look down at the bottom and click on Q&A, you can write your questions there. And Dr. Alan Shell, our GP, question monitor. We'll be monitoring those questions all through the evening and, uh, and bringing a selection of them uh, to you. Thanks, Alan. Uh, so first of all, let's go to a poll and our, uh, our mighty tech, Michael, is going to put up question one. And if you could answer this question, tell us your age, under 30, 30 to 50, 51 to 65, 66 and older. Just giving you some moments to do the clicking and then I'll do the answers. Well, thank you, Michael. Let's have a, a look at the answers, please. So we've got nobody under 30, 7% uh, between uh, 30 and 50, 20% 51 to 65, and 93 people, 73% of our audience so far are over 66. And indeed, I'm 66 myself, so I put myself into that category. Thank you. We've got more people joining us, but let's go to our second poll question, please, Michael. Are you present, uh, presently experiencing no pain, some pain, acute pain, constant pain, or chronic pain? you're just joining us if you could answer the questions that are up on the screen we're just doing a quick poll and Michael can we see the answers here please so no pain 12% some pain 34% acute pain 2% constant pain 18% chronic pain 34% so uh, I think some considerable experience of pain in, in the group that's joined us this evening. And our final poll question goes to the use of medication. How often do you take medication for pain? I try to avoid it. 
every day, multiple times per day. And if I could see the answers, please, Michael. So 51% try to avoid it, 25% every day and 24% multiple times per day. Well, look, if we could uh, move to our panel discussion now, and I just wanna say thank you heaps for giving us that information. I think it really, really helps our panel. So just a reminder, if you've just joined us, we'd love your questions. We're gonna do our best to answer as many of them as possible. Click Q&A and put your questions there. Uh, Dr. Alan Shell is our question host. He'll moderate them, uh, bring questions to us. Anonymous questions are welcome. And just a reminder, we cannot provide detailed information and responses, clinical advice to individuals, but our team of panel members will endeavour to give general significant background information that you can discuss uh, with your own clinical team. And uh, um, anonymous questions are welcome. So we've got four panel members and I'll introduce them in detail as I bring them in. We're very pleased to welcome Sophie Scott, the national medical reporter uh, for ABC TV who joins and, and radio and online and all the other mechanisms. And uh, we're so grateful, Sophie, you're prepared to talk about some of your own experiences of, of pain tonight. Welcome also to Professor Catherine Nicholson Perry, uh, Chair of the Discipline of Psychology. Uh, at the Australian College of Applied Science Psychology and we'll uh, uh, meet Catherine a little later and Tim Austin, our physiotherapist on the team. Uh, and I'll tell you more about Tim a little later. Let's begin with you, if I may, uh, Professor Milton Cohen, AM. He's a pain medicine physician, a rheumatologist as well at St Vincent's Clinic and a conjoint professor at the University of New South Wales School of Medicine. And tonight in Northern Tasmania, uh, Professor Cohen, what are you doing in uh, Northwest Tasmania? Well, just taking a, a second chance at a well-earned holiday. We think of it as going overseas in the COVID era. Well, and indeed, uh, as any uh, uh, dedicated clinician does, I'm assuming your wife is thrilled that you're on a Zoom tonight talking about pain. Yeah, she's uh, quite excited as well, really. <laughs> <laughs> well, look, we're here to talk about... Um, Oh, well, every, about pain and, and, and the sort of questions and approach people can take in their discussions with their team to get effective relief. And one key message I know you want to talk about is we need to take a biopsychosocial framework approach. Biopsychosocial framework. All those years at the ABC failing me completely, but it's to do with uh, the body... Uh, the person and their world. Can you tell us what that's all about and why that's fundamental? Yes, uh, thanks, Julian, Thank and good evening, everyone. It's a pleasure to be able to join this uh, webinar, uh, even if it, is, if it is from northern Tasmania, and I'm sure we maybe we have some Tasmanians on online. It used to be thought that pain was just a problem with the body, uh, a reliable indicator of injury or disease. We now know that's not the case and that the experience of pain has a component from your body, which some people refer to as the bio bit. It also depends on what's happening to you as a person, that's the psycho bit, and what's happening in your world, the social bit. In fact, in teaching pain medicine, we actually turn it upside down. We call it socio-psycho-biomedical, which is an even bigger mouthful, simply to emphasize the importance of the psychological and the social dimensions, as well as the body. So the framework in which we look at it is those three dimensions. We don't know how they interact at a, at a fundamental level, but we know that each of them is important all the time in every situation of pain. And Professor Cohen, does that mean of one of our key messages tonight, and I'll, it's great to see Tim Austin, our physiotherapist, clapping at that point, <laughs> to that point. Does that mean one of our key messages tonight is that we need to find a general practitioner, a pain specialist, and any other allied health members of our team that take that broad framework, that it's not just physical, it's also the mental, emotional, and social context, that that's, that's the foundation. Well, if you have a pain specialist, that, that's, that, that's taken for granted. Uh, by pain specialist, I don't just mean medically trained pain specialists. I mean uh, medical specialists in physical therapy, such as Tim, in psychology, such as Catherine. 
you take that they work in that framework for granted. The big challenge is for the rest of the medical community, uh, primary care and otherwise, to also embrace that, what I'll call biopsychosocial uh, for short, so that when considering people with pain and chronic non-cancer pain in particular, we're not focusing only on the body. We're focusing much more, more broadly than that. When we spoke earlier today, you talked about acute pain, chronic non-cancer pain and cancer pain. Could you just speak to that? Why is it important to think under some headings like that? Yes, thank you. Okay, so acute pain is the sort of pain with which everyone on this webinar will be acquainted. And acute doesn't mean sharp or severe, it means short-lived. So everyone has had an experience of injury or an operation or a, a, a disease that causes pain. And, when, and normally acute pain goes away when that problem heals. Then we have cancer associated pain, uh, the pain which is part of the experience of cancer, which uh, hopefully goes away when the cancer itself is treated or cured, but in fact, which can persist in a different form after treatment, uh, so called post cancer pain. And that blends in with the big group, the biggest group, which is chronic non cancer pain, the biggest cause of chronic pain in our community. And chronic, in this case, by definition, means present for more than three months. That's an arbitrary definition. The way to think of it is that it's not reliably attributable to an ongoing disease or damage process in most cases. So in that respect, it's very different from acute pain, short-lived associated with accident or with injury, which we, in most cases, are going to get better. And that associated with cancer, which hopefully will resolve as the cancer itself is treated. Just repeat, you, you just said, uh, you said something quickly there that I didn't quite catch. Um, and it was to do with this large group of chronic non-cancer pain. Uh, probably I can't, can't be more specific as to what I didn't catch. But as I understand it, one of the things that's critical is that the nervous system can change without an obvious stimulus. And that this understanding what that means is critical to understanding chronic non-cancer pain. Would you, would you speak to that? Yes, well, in, in, in many cases of chronic non-cancer pain, and let's just take a couple of quick examples. Probably most cases of chronic low back pain and also a condition called fibromyalgia, which may well be familiar to people on this webinar. What does it mean? Well, these are labels, they're labels given. You see, our labeling, our clinical labeling in this area remains a problem. So the words we use aren't that good. If somebody says, I've got low back pain, and the doctor says, yes, you've got low back pain, I don't think we've got very far in our therapeutic relationship. But to come back to the point, we now recognize, and this is recent knowledge, that in cases like fibromyalgia, in many cases of chronic low back pain, there is no active disease or damage process going on. But that part of the nervous system that normally signals pain or tissue damage, to, to be brief, is switched on. And we call that sensitization. The, person, the person's pain signaling system, I don't like the term, but it's the, probably the best, most concise way to talk about it, has been switched on. And so the experience of pain is the same as pain. It's just that there's no obvious driver for it. Because I want to look at you and listen and not Google fibromyalgia, could you just give us a definition? You're uh, I, I, out I, there, I've got to land the fish. Okay. I can't give you a definition, but fibromyalgia is a term that is used to describe the experience of chronic widespread pain where there's no obvious other explanation. Look, just before I, I leave you, and, and I want to talk to Sophie Scott, and then I'll go to some initial questions. When I spoke to you, you said, I, I mentioned I'd had cancer, so I've, I'm a cancer survivor. And when you have cancer, you get a multidisciplinary team. I had 
There were so many people in my life, I needed a, a, a filing system to, con to keep track of all the people who were assisting me to, to, tr to be treated, to manage extensive dilemmas with pain, which was managed by a whole range of people, not just doctors and not just medication, and then to survive and get well. And I was left with the impression that that kind of comprehensive team approach with them all talking to each other and a nurse coordinator to make sure that they did is sadly missing for those dealing with chronic non-cancer pain. And that that is a real problem for people because they don't get the validation of their experience that I got as a cancer patient. Could you explain the, why is it, is it important to have validation and a team? And why isn't there that offered uh, to non-cancer people with chronic pain? So, Julie, there are only about five or ten questions rolled up there, so I'll just... Uh, I'll take I know how concise and intelligent you can be. I'll, I'll take them one at a time. If you have cancer, as has been your own experience, there's no question about the diagnosis. The community recognise that cancer, in all its forms, is a nasty thing to happen. And the, and the, the treatment follows normal, what we call, biomedical principles. You treat the underlying cancer, and the patient gets better. So your predicament, your situation is very readily validated in our community. People recognize that. One of the difficulties with chronic non-cancer pain is because it is, in many cases, it's very difficult to say precisely what's going on in the same way as you can say with cancer. People have multiple investigations, see many people and they say, we can't find what's going on, we do not know what is causing your pain. And our society had a default position some years ago that if you can't find it in the body, it must be in the mind. In other words, people are imagining it and nothing could be further from the truth. Mm. But that is the predicament faced by many people with chronic non-cancer pain. They're, it is not validated. And yes, in the area of chronic non-cancer pain and pain generally, we do encourage and we teach multidisciplinary approaches. But the reason why they are few and far between is because the area is not funded in the same way as acute pain and cancer pain is funded. Yes, a big tick. Yes, we're getting lots of clapping and thumbs up. Um, just before I come to you, Sophie, Tim Austin, if I could just bring you in for one second, and thank you so much, Professor Khan, for that very strong uh, opening. Um, Tim is a physiotherapist. Um, he has a master's degree in pain management and he works in primary care in, in general practice in a multidisciplinary pain centre. Why I just wanted to come to you quickly, Tim, is the very first thing you said is it's so important to say to the patient with chronic non-cancer pain, we believe you, your pain is real, but it might be complicated to sort it out. Why is it so important to say that? I think it's really, oh, hello and welcome to everybody and thanks for the opportunity. Uh, look, I'd, I'd sort of uh, come along from what Milton was just talking about. We've come from this prevailing view of finding a specific cause in the body for pain. And so when we quite rightly start to talk about the fact that pain is complex and you can't find this cause in the body uh, for the pain straight away, then people start to wonder whether we think it's all in their head. And so it's so important to say to people, if you feel pain, your pain is real. Uh, but sometimes we joke with people and say, but it's really complicated. Yeah. Uh, and uh, and to say to people, that? what do you mean? Well, it, because pain is that biopsychosocial experience, uh, and it's an experience, not necessarily just a sensation. We experience it as a nastiness of our life. And so we need to explore all of those different domains uh, that Milton was talking about. We've got to explore that biological domain and say, uh, let's make sure we're not missing anything. But then we're asking to uh, asking people with pain if we're allowed to explore with them all of the different issues that are going on with them to, um, in their life and in their context so that we can try and help them to understand their pain as we are trying to understand it as well. Well, thanks, Tim. And, and Sophie Scott, if I can come to you as someone who... And Sophie, of course, is the national medical reporter with uh, ABC TV News radio, online, and, and an ambassador also for Bowel Cancer Australia. Sophie, I I've got a number of things I want to ask you, but is there any comment you'd like to make about what's been said by so far? Because I can see you nodding 
and clapping at various points. Well, just only that I just completely in, endorse what Tim and Milton were both saying about um, a, a lot of things, but mainly I, I'll tell you my experience, Julie, and why what, what they said resonated. I developed um, an acute injury in my right wrist, which was basically a tendonitis, which turned into like a tendinopathy. And But what happened was, which is exactly what Milton and, and Tim were just saying, is it, I was in so much pain, but on scans and on ultrasounds there was there was nothing to be seen there but that that was not was I was experiencing this high degree of pain yet yet to the visual eye to the eye there was nothing on the scan and the only way the the, the way that I came to recognize it and the analogy that really worked for me is that when pain becomes chronic it's like a car alarm is going off but the car has been stolen and the car's vanished but the alarm's still going. And the alarm is the part is the part of the, your brain that's activated to recognize that you're in pain. And so when I recognized that, that's why it then, it then made sense to me why painkillers were not working because the, the, the painkillers for the acute pain were not gonna help in this chronic pain situation. And I also realized how much the pain that you experience is linked in with, with your mood, your fatigue levels, um, whether you've had a you know a, a big day at work, a stressful week, it's not doesn't just doesn't exist in a vacuum. It exists in all those other things around it, and you have to treat it in that way. And I found that um, you know if it's great if you can go to a, a clinic or somewhere and get that that help from all the different areas. But as a, as an empowered patient yourself, you can also seek out those other resources yourself to help you deal with the the psychological aspect of pain which is I think at the, the the root of everything so the pain is definitely real for chronic pain but a lot of it is how you view the pain as well because a lot of chronic pain for me is not just the unpleasant sensation but it's also the the fear of like oh I'm in pain now and what if I keep feeling like this what if I keep feeling like this for the rest of the week? And it's fine that I'm in pain now sitting talking to you, but what if I feel like this when I've got a really busy day at work tomorrow? So it's, it's, it's not so much just your experience at that moment, but it's what you project into the future of how you might be in the future. But, um, but I can share some resources with the audience a little later in terms of um, you know, apps and podcasts and different things that have helped me from a psychological point of view that I think it's really worth checking in with with people. And I think as a journalist, I'm very, I was very much, I want every investigation done. I want every x-ray and ultrasound and do this and do that and find this. And, and, you, and you hold on to a word. If a doctor says, oh, I can see there's a bit of something, I can see there's a bit of a, you know, a bit of inflammation here or a bit of that. You're like, oh, well, that's what must be causing it then. But then what you come to realize is that that might've been there in the past, but it's not there anymore. What you're left with is that car alarm still going off. Sophie, that was a fantastic opening, and I, I'm just going to uh, have a quick remark from uh, uh, Catherine Nicholson Perry, and we'll go to questions. I'll, I'll be, I've got so much more I want to ask you, but I'll come back. What strikes me, and I, I should just introduce Professor Catherine Nicholson Perry is the chair of the discipline uh, for uh, psychological science at the Australian College of Applied Psychology, extensive experience in the United Kingdom uh, and also in Australia. Uh, 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 Catherine, I guess what really strikes me as I listen to Sophie, and if you could pop your mic on for me, um, is how open she is to the idea of a psychological dimension. And uh, I'm just wondering how common is that? You know, that because I, I, I have a, a relative who was infuriated when dealing with chronic pain that they keep thinking it's in my head. So I took her to be unresponsive to the biopsychosocial framework that you lot are encouraging. So how representative is Sophie Scott? Look, I think um, a lot of people have not heard the news that psychological factors are a, a bigger part of people's experience of pain. Um, and so they are processing information that's happening for them within their understanding of pain. And most of us walk around with a kind of a working model, if you like, of pain that's based on acute pain. So pain that is very clearly linked with some kind of trauma or injury or illness. And for those of us who end up with a chronic pain problem, it's a fairly large 
you know, percentage of the Australian population. When we go into that situation, all we know is that acute model of pain. And I sometimes liken it to uh, parenting. You know, everyone has a view about parenting because you've either parented or been parented. And so it, this is one of those health conditions where all of us have usually had some experience of pain. So we come already with some kind of an understanding. Um, so that means that as clinicians, you've really got to start from the position that someone's at. What is it that they understand? Um, how attached are they to that understanding? Is there some way that you can help to illustrate uh, in some way that perhaps that link between injury or illness and pain is not as tight as they think it is. Some good examples include things like um, migraine headaches or headaches, you know, where you, you can have a headache, there's more than likely uh, nothing that's kind of physically changed about you and, and your body at the time, uh, but you can still experience the pain. Or another one is uh, phantom limb pains that uh, sometimes people would be aware of where someone's had an amputation, for example, but they can still feel the pain that they had had prior to the amputation. Uh, but they can see that there's no body part there to actually be experiencing that pain in. So you've got to find a few little windows where that link between injury and pain doesn't quite add up. And once you can find a little way in there, then that gives you the opportunity to start kind of exploring what might explain why there isn't always that complete correlation between having an injury and experiencing pain. Look, thank you so much. Uh, I'd like to come now uh, and invite back Dr. Alan Schell, who, uh, if you've just joined us, is monitoring your questions through the Q&A button, and he will give us a sense of some of the themes that are coming, and we'll answer as many questions as we can. Over to you, Alan. Uh, thank you, and thank you, panellists. As is usual, Catherine and certainly Milton have, and, and Sophie have answered some of the questions that have been asked. Uh, there are quite a few individual questions, but I think one that's come up is the new acronym I haven't heard of, Complex Regional Pain Syndrome. And the second part of that is, if you're looking at a multidisciplinary team, how many of those actually exist in Sydney or Melbourne or elsewhere uh, is the problem. And if it's got to do with Medicare, then I guess we have a bit of a problem, Milton. Now, could you just, thank you, uh, Alan, and we'll come to the team question in a second, but just repeat the first term that you want to explain just chronic so regional it. pain syndrome crps uh, milton are you best to come to on that to kick off yes I'm, I'm happy to julie it actually crps actually stands for complex regional pain syndrome not chronic regional pain syndrome and complex regional pain syndrome is a relatively uncommon condition seen after accident or injury where the part heals, but pain persists. And it's a very good example of what uh, we were mentioning before, that there's been a change in that part of the nervous system that normally signals tissue damage, such that the signal is persisting. It's the car alarm analogy that Sophie mentioned. Uh, and it's, uh, it commonly affects uh, an upper limb, uh, it's not just the limb, it's the whole person and the whole person's context, as has been mentioned before. Notoriously difficult to treat, but again, and can respond to a large extent, might not go away, but respond to a large extent to a multidisciplinary approach. How much harder is it for a patient or a person if they have something like that that isn't common? Um, I, I wanted to raise tonight burning tongue syndrome because a, a country woman I'm aware of who's watching tonight ha, has got that. And if you were just could very quickly, Milton, explain what that is. But and then just answer that question. If you've got something that's not that common, how much harder is it to get help? Well, it's enormous. It, it's very hard. I think it's, the, the point should be made to understand these problems is actually hard for clinicians as well. We do not have all the answers. The science is great. It's not all in, it's, evolved, it's rapidly evolving. We don't have all the answers. We don't know why uh, after say, what might appear to be a simple sprain of the wrist, that somebody might go on to complex regional pain syndrome or in between. 
we just don't know why. We know, we, we know it does happen. We have some insight into how it happens, but we don't know any more than that. The same thing applies to the, uh, I think the burning, burning tongue syndrome you mentioned. Now this is a very distressing and very uncommon problem, often called burning mouth syndrome, where again, the pain is in the mouth, uh, a grievous effect on overall quality of life, but it's not clear what's causing it. If it were clear what's causing it, it'd be a nutritional, a nutritional deficiency or bad reflux or another disease. That's not quite the same thing as what we're talking about here. Yeah. Uh, so if the patient has an uncommon problem and the clinician is not confident about what they're dealing with, that is a pretty difficult situation for all concerned. Yeah. It's diabolical. Tim, can I bring you in? Tim Austin, uh, our um, physiotherapist working in primary care. This question, I think you are in a multidisciplinary pain centre. And the other part of this question is how common are these centres? And I guess an underpinning that is when we talk about multidisciplinary, who are the classic members of it and how crucial is the GP? Yeah, look, uh... You keep asking six questions at once, Julie. It's hard to keep up. <laughs> Look, the, 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 team, the team approach with, with those really challenging diagnoses, uh, can I just say a bit of a point of advice for people? Be prepared to ask questions whether your GP or the clinicians who you're associated with have experience dealing with those uh, because it's quite acceptable to, to say, I'd like to find somebody who knows about this um, but most of them are dealt with best in a team environment. Now, I'm, I'm fortunate I do a lot of work in true primary care as a physio, seeing people off the street, as, as we would call it, and uh, right through to working in a private uh, pain management clinic where people are referred and we work as a team. So I see the challenges um, in particularly primary care where people visit their, uh, their GP, for example, and then trying to access uh, relevant, uh, particularly allied health, um, is very difficult because the funding is not there, uh, as Milton uh, noted before. Uh, now, there's a little bit of available funding through Medicare, but really that's what's got to change to get better outcomes for the treatment to be done in teams. And who are classically in these teams? Yes, indeed. So, uh, uh, you'll certainly have your friendly uh, Catherine Nicholson-Perry as a psychologist. And more psychologists are understanding pain. Psychologists have obviously for, for a long time uh, dealt with issues of depression and anxiety, but uh, they're increasingly getting a bit better at pain. They're not all specialists at it. And that's why I'm sure Catherine would, uh, would say that you need to find somebody who says, yes, that, that's the work I do. You may well have uh, occupational therapists being involved. Uh, pain clinics will almost certainly have a nurse uh, a specialist nurse uh, involved, uh, and they may well have different medical disciplines, as Milton's uh, said before. That's in a pain clinic. But in primary care, uh, you're most likely to have physios and psychologists, and you might also have, uh, uh, have your occupational therapists and possibly some nursing care as well. Catherine Nicholson, Perry, do, are, we, is, are you able to give us a sense of how many of these multidisciplinary teams are available in both public and private? Oh, now you're asking. There is a published uh, list of them um, that I'm aware of on the Australian Pain Society website. And obviously, I mean, it's the, the usual issue with um, accessing those kinds of specialist care services that they tend to be uh, more of them in the big metropolitan uh, centres and fewer of them available in kind of regional or rural areas. Um, and so they can be uh, difficult to access, particularly if you're not kind of close by. Some of them are private and some of them are public. That's certainly the case. Um, but a, a lot of people, are, I'm not exactly sure what the stats are now, but certainly uh, often people have been seeking assistance for their chronic pain for a long time before they get access to those kinds of services. You know, you might be talking about 
several years before they, they would get there. So by which time often um, they've experienced, they may have experienced care that is not ideal for them, that may also have uh, made them less, or less trusting or um, kind of concerned about the quality of response that they're going to get. I'm going to come to you, Sophie, for patient response in a minute, but Milton, I'm getting a little edgy here. You're telling me a lot of your medical colleagues uh, um, are Ill insufficiently informed about the need for a multidisciplinary approach and a, a, a approach that looks at the body, the person and their social context. And we're now hearing that, uh, you know, there aren't too many of these teams that are readily accessible and there's long waiting lists. So there must be a lot of people watching tonight are in despair. That may well be the case, uh, Julie. And it's a, it's a bit of an indictment on our system because, you know, for at, at least 20 years or, or more, the clinical pain community has been lobbying the authorities to point out that not only the prevalence of chronic non-cancer pain in particular, is high in the community. Its cost to the community out is uh, greater than that of heart disease, diabetes put together. Yet it is not, and, and we know that a multidisciplinary approach in the broad framework we're talking about is the way to go, yet the funding has not followed. So the, frust the frustration becomes not only a political problem, but it's one of those social factors we've mentioned before that can amplify the experience of pain. I simply cannot get access to the approach that I need. Sophie, your comments on what we've heard, and then I'd love to hear how you have managed this experience. Have you got a team? Who's in it and where did you find them? Uh, well, look, I've had a number of different approaches. I guess I went down the traditional road of seeing all the doctors and I did go to a couple of pain clinics um, and I, I, I saw I saw lots. I saw sports physicians and physios and every, everything I could when I was still trying to really find a solution. I guess I was very solutions focused. I was like, I'm in pain. I want it sorted. I want it to go away, you know, that sort of. The, the sort of mindset you might have when it's more like an acute pain. Whereas I think the difficult thing, and I remember even walking out of a pain clinic when they were telling me, you know, oh, you need to sort of, not you need to live with it, but you need to sort of recognize the psychological aspect of it. And I walked out and I thought, they don't know what they're talking about. And I took some more painkillers. And it, so it was a long journey for me to accept that the pain is real, but that just taking lots of painkillers was not going to really help in, in the long term. What was going to help were things like um, pacing. So given it's my wrist, I can't be, if I'm on the computer all day, if I'm texting all day, um, it's going to flare up. If I'm tired, if I'm stressed, if I'm, you know, the, the, the psychological aspects do play into how magnified the pain can be. But also then on that's that's on one side, but on the positive side, it's things like um, listening to podcasts where they really explore because I love knowledge and learning the concept of what they call neuroplastic pain, which is, ex, you know, exploring the fact that there is that psychological component. So there's a very good podcast called Tell Me About Your Pain that I would recommend. It's an American podcast with a lot of pain specialists and patients where they talk about the evidence base for this exact approach that everyone's talking about tonight. And it's just very validating to hear experts talking about it from that point of view. And so if you can't get to a pain clinic, you can listen to the podcast and hear these, these experiences. There's also a lot of really good online resources for people. I know Macquarie University has a very good pain management course and I've recommended I've done that. And I've recommended that to lots of people. Um, for people who don't, who can't get into pain clinics, um, because that taught me about pacing. Um, so yeah, so there's more about pacing. So pacing if you give an example. Basically, uh, the, well, I mean, the experts could say more, but it, it, it's not doing too much, Julie, like not just sitting on the couch and taking painkillers and thinking, I feel in so much pain, I can't do anything, because that then can make you feel more depressed. And But it's then not, also not overdoing it. So it's not going a million miles an hour and doing things that you know are going to flare your pain up and feeling so worn out and tired that the pain's worse. And it's so it's pacing yourself not only over a day, but it might be over a week or a month and recognising that some days you're going to be able to do more than others. 
Um, so that's, to me, that's sort of my interpretation of pacing. And, and that's also a big issue for people who have fatigue as well, um, which I have as well. So pacing comes into fatigue where you can't do everything you might want to do um, every day. So um, and recognising that you're going to have some good days and some bad days. But, but having those checking in moments of thinking, if I'm having a bad day, maybe I should just like listen to one of those podcasts or I should jump on that pain, that pain website and get a few tips because um, that can make you feel feel better when you know that that um, that painkillers are not necessarily going to work for me anyway they don't work so uh, and they come with side effects that I'd rather not have and, and Sophie who's coordinating your care are you coordinating your care is your GP <laughs> or how do you perceive that um, I, I coordinate it myself but I'm in, probably in a privileged position where I'm very interested in in it and I seek out information myself. And I'm also, I've, I've, I've interviewed lots of people who suffer a lot of pain. I did a lot of stories about um, women and men too, but a lot of women who had the pelvic mesh and they were left in, cr in chronic debilitating pain, Julie, that you know these women couldn't sit down for more than about 20 minutes at a time. They were just in agony. And, and part of my um, advocacy for them was helping them get resources about pain that they could access too. So, I mean, I think in an ideal world, if you have an amazing group of clinicians like we've got on this team tonight looking after you, that would be amazing. But if you, if you don't, there are, um, there are other resources that you can also look for yourself that, um, that can help, like, like those, those um, online pain management courses and the podcasts and things like that. Because then you, you do feel a sense of empowerment as well. That's the thing. We have a wealth of people listening in here and uh, we'll collect this information. Also, the list that uh, Catherine has mentioned of pain clinics and uh, there will be a, like a mail out after of some of the resources that are being mentioned. If I could just say, Sophie, I admire you so much mm. for staying in the brutal world of the media <laughs> uh, and, 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 and implementing pacing. I mean, that's just, you know, seriously admirable not, not always easy in the pandemic i tell you <laughs> I can't imagine and there's so much of this texting stuff goes on these days which gives us all a bit of pain doesn't it um but tim just before i go to the next question i know you know sophie mentioned it's not sitting on the couch and not moving and taking mm. pain uh, killers i know that you are of the view that generally activity is beneficial for pain and most people can benefit from it even though you may need to tailor it to the individual. As a physio, can you just talk to that? Yeah, look, uh, Sophie's is a great story. Um, I think it was Jessica who early used that phrase, pain talks. Uh, pain talks so many different languages, so many, so many different experiences. Uh, uh, there's so much language we use around pain, as, as Milton said. And I think, I mean, Sophie shared a lot about her life. She shared a lot about her mind when she told us her story. And, uh, and, and to the answer to your question is, we're not going to treat Sophie the same way that we're going to treat uh, even Sophie's twin sister, because they're going to have different stories. And, uh, and so when it comes to activity, whilst we can say that the vast majority of, uh, of, of uh, chronic pain conditions, uh, activity is going to be beneficial for, uh, we've got to tailor it and we've got to understand the problems. Uh, we've talked about this thing called sensitivity, which is basically where the nervous system gets turned on and it gets, it, it's hardwired, it's up to here and it's going, going, going. And of course, on those days, uh, you know, if anybody does too much, they're just going to fire their system up more. But the, the, uh, the opposite extreme is not helpful either of doing nothing. So we've got this idea, pacing is very complicated. <laughs> And the research on it is really complicated too. Um, it, it's not been well researched, but we, we kind of get the basics. But we know that some things need to be paced really strongly. Sometimes people need to work through their story of what's going on. Sophie shared that she really likes knowledge. Everybody wants knowledge, but we've got to give people the knowledge that's going to help them move forward. Uh, we started to learn about 10 years ago that teaching people about pain helped. Uh, the problem is we tried to commoditize it and give everybody the same information. And unsurprisingly, that didn't work. So we've tried to give them, we tried to work out what they need and what they want and what's going to help them move towards what they really want to do and use the information, use the right physical activity 
uh, to get there. Some things need to be uh, done to get you stronger, sometimes fitter, sometimes to lose some weight, sometimes to, uh, to do a whole range of things. And uh, let's work together because you're an individual. Look, thank you so much. Alan Shell, if I could, we could hear more from uh, the questions coming in and uh, a new question, please. Well, thank you again. I think many, many of the questions have been answered in, in, in your discussion. One, one I think is a good one is, how is a pain physiotherapist any different to my usual physiotherapist? And with that, uh, the, back to the holistic approach, um, is that going to suit everybody? And I think in some ways you've answered, well, it doesn't suit everybody. So they came up with other options such as CBT, which is uh, that psychological management uh, therapy, cognitive behaviour therapy, and the other one was on virtual reality. So perhaps the psychologist here could, first the physio, maybe the psychologist could discuss that one. So is there a difference between my local yeah, I'll, physio? I'll, I'll jump in first. Yeah. 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 That there are some GPs who uh, who are you know in a sense subspecialised in in their particular area, whether it be skin or or, or cancer, um, and the same the reason that there's actually pain physicians uh, like Milton uh, coming from different backgrounds but specialising in pain and psychologists too, uh, some physios uh, and an increasing number uh, across Australia recognised through the Australian Physio Association. We've got about 150 to 200 physios that are acknowledged to have some special interest in, in treating persistent and chronic pain. And, uh, and so they may well do things differently. Uh, we sometimes talk about psychologically informed practice, which just basically means we're trying to look at the whole person and not just give them a bunch of exercises. Um, and my profession has been a bit guilty of that. I've probably been guilty of that as a young physio too. But uh, we move on, we learn, and we learn how to treat people um, you know, appropriately uh, in that manner. There was one other question I thought I might give a quick answer to before you went to Catherine. What was the uh, Alan, question? can you just repeat the second, the second aspect of that, please? Yeah, the, the use of um, behaviour well, Virtual reality. And and virtual reality yes, yes. May, I, what i may do if i if i may tim i want to come down to Catherine on that if yes. i may just because she's our psychology uh, <laughs> uh, character in the story I'm probably in a better position to answer the virtual reality question to be honest i, I was going to answer it because a lot of the physios uh in research have been looking at it julie and that's uh often where it's come from the um Look, there's some promising beginnings of the research, but we've got a long way to go. So explain um, what virtual reality is and how it might be applied in this context. Well, we, we've got all sorts of different machines where you can put your headset on and you can put your screen on and your screen shows you moving your arm. And so the, I'm being very simplistic here, but um, that shows me that I can see myself moving my arm or can give me the assistance of a visual input to try and change my movement and change my behaviour. And, um, and so there's a whole range of, of potential therapies in that. As you can imagine, with that sort of technology, uh, people who are good at that technology can do a lot of things in a short amount of time, and uh, the research hasn't kind of caught up with them. <laughs> so there's all sorts of, of, of things happening. I think we'll see some positivity out of it, but we're not there quite just yet. If I could just quickly say, in my field as a cancer patient, virtual reality is being used to prepare the patient, uh, particularly children, but I'd, I'd like to see it applied more to adults, for the treatment experience. Many of these treatments can seem a little bizarre if you're not familiar mm -hmm. with them. Mm -hmm. And so a chance to put yourself in the position of the patient before it happens. But again, mm -hmm. I don't think the research is... Is, is, is running behind what mm -hmm. innovative places like Peter McCallum Cancer Centre in Victoria are just, are just doing. But sorry, Alan, I think you wanted to come in there. Well, well I think the same you're already using in physio, the, the sort of the we teaching people to get back to their sport using a virtual reality on a screen. So I think that the whole innovation of computer and artificial intelligence is going to assist us, I think, in the future. Yeah. So Catherine, if you could come to this, you know, what some people are thinking is, does this approach apply to everyone, you know, this emphasis on the significance of the psychological? What would be your response to that? Look, I'd say, and I think Milton said something similar earlier on, that for everybody, it's a different mix of those different component parts. 
um, I like to think of it as a bit like a, a jigsaw puzzle. You know, there's usually a place for, you know, the, some um, biologically based interventions, some psychologically based interventions, some things that need to be changed um, in people's environment. And that can be down to really simple things like, you know, measures in the workplace, the attitudes of your colleagues to you, if you need to take some time off or those kinds of things. But the size of each of those pieces and the way they combine together is different for everybody. Um, and I think going back as well to what Tim was saying about kind of the educational part of it, I think that's really important as well. And I guess that's sort of what I was referring to a little bit in relation to just getting a foot in the door with uh, clients who perhaps are sceptical of the idea that psychology might have anything to do with it. And it's not that they need to develop a, you know, postgraduate level understanding of all of the elements of, of pain and the mechanisms that cause pain. They really just have to have a working model that allows them to um, see the potential benefit for some of these more self-management strategies, we would co kind of co collectively call them. Um, and cognitive behavioral therapy was, is one of the different types of psychological interventions that have been embedded into this broader multidisciplinary pain management. But there are a number of others that have been demonstrated to be equally effective. They had a lot of common components to them. Pacing's a, a common component, um, some element of looking at the way that you're thinking about the pain uh, and how that might serve to either um, you know, augment the pain experience you're having, having or dampening it down. Can I just say what strikes me in in, in what you and Tim are, are, are emphasising and, and, and Milton is that the clinician really needs to know the patient. They need to know about their life. They need to know their story. Absolutely. Now, I know, Catherine, you believe the general practitioner is crucial because they are the access point to psychology or even to specialist teams or specialist physicians such as Milton. Um, but I'm wondering how this fits with the 15 minute, um, you know, appointment that is so common. Uh, yeah. And particularly if you're not, I mean, I go to a practice where I pay a lump of extra money to get a longer session, but a lot of people have bulk billing. So mm -hmm. if the GP is crucial, what more needs to happen with the GP? Well, I think, I mean, there's a, a lot of work has gone into um, working with GPs around the kinds of knowledge and skills that, that you need as a, as a general practitioner. And honestly, I would not be a general dollars because you know everybody expects them to be up to speed with every kind of presentation that you might turn up um, with so it's you know it's not fair to expect them to have all of the detailed knowledge I guess it their role is often as a gatekeeper to other kinds of services and so it's really important for them to have an understanding of this contemporary uh, way that we look at chronic pain and to understand that um, you know there may be a psychological comp component there may be a social component going on and that it, uh, under certain circumstances um, a client would might need to be referred to a multidisciplinary pain clinic but on others other occasions maybe it's going to be enough to to suggest that they follow up some of the things that Sophie was talking about. So actually the, the pain program that the Mindspot Clinic at Macquarie Uni um, offers is uh, freely available, but it was based on um, a pain management program that we originally, uh, a number of us put together and trialed through Macquarie Uni's um, kind of research arm around uh, online mental health services. Uh, and it reflects very closely the kind of multidisciplinary pain management intervention that you, you get going to a pain clinic. And even looking at people with quite severe levels of chronic pain, who'd had it for quite a long time, that looked quite similar to the kind of population of people who would go to a chronic pain clinic, we saw incredibly good um, uh, and highly significant changes in things like their mood, um, some shift in their pain. But the interesting thing with these kind of interventions is that the benefit the patient get is not dependent on changing their pain level. It's more on helping them to get back in control of their lives, to improve their mood, to improve their fitness, to get back to doing things that make, you know, that make everyday life worthwhile. Um, and they eventually discover that actually they can do those things without having to change the pain itself. Uh, and that's the really critical thing. I think we're kind of trained to think that 
everything depends on changing the pain and you only get the benefits if you've done that but actually these programs demonstrate that, that that's not the case but you know as Sophie was saying that can be a pretty hard sell mm -hmm. and I'm sure I've had lots of clients in the past who've left thinking exactly the same as you as you mentioned Sophie I even had well, one uh, have to come in because I can tell that Milton's about to explode <laughs> Milton, what's happening what do you need to say <laughs> Well, not so much as well, just a crawl around. Look, it's, it's, um, there are two, two aspects of what I want to say. One is that clearly a 15 minute consultation is not long enough for this complex situation. So the wheels have to change there. I believe they are changing in terms of adequately remunerating primary care physicians for the time it takes to do, to deal with this complex material. But one of the most important aspects of treatment which we have alluded to but haven't brought out in the open just yet is the power of an accurate explanation of what is going on so i will frequently say to my patients what is your understanding or what have you been told is actually the matter and the amount of misinformation and mythology which comes out is really um not, doesn't surprise me anymore but it is a great excuse for getting there and giving the patient a cogent, accurate, up-to-date explanation of what's going on. So that that's the first step to encouraging self-management. If you are living with your chronic pain situation and you are hoping that there's going to some magical cure out there or something's going to pop out of the woodwork and you're going to be fine after a 20-year history, that is magical thinking. It's not going to happen. And that sort, of, that sort of mythology needs to be explained. And the primary care physician who knows the patient and their background and their circumstances is really very well placed to provide that accurate explanation, provided, of course, that they work in this biopsychosocial framework. Just before I bring you in, Sophie, I just want to say, Milton, encourage them to record what you say on your phone. I can uh, on their phone so they can play it back as a cancer patient whenever I got those wonderful concise summaries I just desperately needed to record them and, and unless the physician invites you to do so you can feel a, um, a little bit presumptuous but sorry Sophie you want to come in I was just going to say because it's understanding what's going on is really important and there was one particular episode of this of the podcast tell me about your pain where they interviewed a an ex-footballer who actually had had serious physical injuries that had resolved and he but he was still in a lot of pain and it was only when they helped him to understand the that it was a, a mind and body thing he was going through and they helped him deal with the pain that his pain levels reduced so this was someone who actually did have physical injuries but even in spite of that he was able to reduce his pain levels by taking this more holistic approach and this more mind body approach to pain. And by saying, and the thing I worry a little bit about Julie is we don't want people to go away thinking, oh, the pain's not real or the pain's just in my head and it's not real. That's not the case. You are feeling it, it hurts, it's real, but it's how you handle it. And what's gonna make a difference is by thinking in that more holistic way. It's a, it's a mind and a body sensation. And even if you do have um, diagnoses of things like, you know, arthritis or like this footballer had injuries and he was taking a lot of medication, but wasn't really getting much relief. And only when he really started to embrace this more holistic approach of, um, of doing things like pacing and other things like, you know, um, meditation and, and uh, things that were going to help his quality of life improve, did his pain levels go down? So that, that made a difference play any role in your management of your pain Sophie what was that Julie Does medication play not, not really these days look I do suffer from migraines as well just for my just to you know for <laughs> add to good measure and I do take medication for the migraines um, but for the wrist tendinopathy it, it I can take Panadol or whatever but I know it's not going to really help can I just thank you again for being so open as a public figure? Now, really, it's it's enormously assisting. Alan, thank you. So while you're talking about Medicare and all those issues, there are, and 
and now an updated version of uh, Medicare items called chronic disease and complex care management. So GPs are, and the fact that we have 73% of people over the age of 66 means that those people, certainly 75 plus, but those people who require complex care management are actually, the, the GP does have a number of items, their new items are 700 series, uh, where people can be discussed with their complex and you can, as a GP, be part of then a multidisciplinary team to discuss those matters. There's also some Medicare item numbers now for psychology support at five to 10 sessions, I believe. So there is, and, and continues to be an upgrade, of course, and somebody also noted in our Q&A that the federal government talks about uh, pain management, but as actually hasn't allocated monies to support that. So I think all the things we're talking about tonight and with, the, with uh, Jessica's APMA, we've got to have a, a bodies that are going to promote um, as we're doing tonight. And, and the, all the people over, you know, 200 people out there tonight, I mean, they're representative consumers who many of them are trying to have their chronic pain treated tonight and were not able to do that. So I think that there are Medicare items, GPs can be involved, they can be part of the, the complex team. It's not that complex, it's a multidisciplinary team. And we do have very good specialists out there. And I guess they're overwhelmed as Milton is uh, in trying to sort out some people's misconceptions of their pain. Um, and all those things that you discussed are the issues, aren't they? Yeah. I think I could quickly say, just for people who joined us after, we had an opening presentation, ladies and gentlemen, from uh, Jessica Taylor from the Australian Pain Management Association. And she mentioned that her website is also very useful. So uh, that, that's the Australian Pain Management Association. Um, can I ask Alan and then Sophie, if I may, Alan, for someone, uh, um, it, it strikes me from what I've heard so far, that you need to have a general practitioner who is open to this more uh, complex approach to the management of pain, that it's not just about physical, it's about psychological and it's about your social context and issues like pacing and so on. So what are the questions a patient should ask their GP to see if they're on board with that philosophy? Because if they're not, um, should you change GP? And I might come to you in a second, Sophie. What are the <laughs> you would recommend but what would you say Alan as a GP? Well sadly too many practices are busy and they hand out the Panadols and the Panadine which has come off and they get up to the Lyrica and to the opioids and and even now and we will talk about it do I need to have can, can, the, the cannabinoids uh, cannabis oil you know I, I believe that's going to work so people are looking and searching so I think for the GP it's to sit down with the patients okay as you said what what do you think the pain is and are there some elements, again, people saying, I'm getting so depressed and distressed about my pain. So they're going to be some psychological. So I think it's up for the GP to listen to their patients. And if they're astute, as you're saying, some of us are, then we have to say, look, I believe that there's a multitasking issue here. We have to look at the psychology of this, look at the, is there an origin, as we pointed out, so we've done our MRIs or we've done our X-rays. And as Sophie said, well, I didn't get an answer. So I've got to go looking for something. I don't think there's one question you can ask but I think certainly your usual GP is the one who knows what medicines you're taking, what complex comorbidities you have as you get older and needs to search out reasonable assistance that may be psychologist or physical therapist and, and or that specialist plain clinic, which there aren't many of. So, so I, I think it's a question of, it, it's a relationship between the GP and the patient yes. uh, to get to know your patients and to talk about what is the worst part of your pain? Because medicines today, you're going to reach a point where you become quite, in a way, addicted to them and your receptors are saying, hey, I want more or you've given me more, but it's not helping. So the patient is also in a conundrum. So we're at a point... Thank you, Alan. I'm just going to come to Sophie. Sophie, as, as someone who's gone down this path, what, what any suggestions on what the patient should be asking their clinician to see if they're on board with this, this approach? Well, I think a good approach, I, I've been seeing a physician recently and, and she was she said to me, look, I can't guarantee that I'll get you 100% better, but what matters the most to you in terms of your functioning and, and what, you know, what would you like to be able to do? And let's see what we can do to get you to be able to do that. And I think that's a very good collaborative approach when it comes to pain as well. 
you know, what matters to you in terms of, do you want to be able to go for, to be able to walk and so you can take your grandkids to the park? Or do you want to be able to, you know, like for me, I like to, to do some like exercise on the weekend or so having that approach of like, what are the key things that would be seen as a success in terms of your treatment? Um, and, and it's mainly about the level of functioning and your quality of life when it comes to pain, because with chronic pain, you may not be able to get rid of it completely. But if you can function and do the things that you want to do in spite of the pain, then it, then the pain almost is, becomes secondary and it doesn't really matter anymore. So that's, yeah, so that's, that's the approach that I really liked and, and I, that's worked well for me. So I would seek out doc, you know professionals that that will work with you on that approach so that you can reach the milestones and the level of functioning that really matters to you. And that's gonna be different for every person. And that's why you need to have that personalized approach. And if you can work with an, a great GP and a great physio and a great psychologist, and or if you can't, then then find those resources yourself. Um, but you know, th there, there is help out there, whether it's amazing clinicians like you've got on the webinar tonight or online resources as well. So I want people to come away feeling like there is help out there, um, whether they seek it in person or whether they can seek it online. Um, there's definitely help and, and you can do a lot to improve your quality of life because it can, it can be quite overwhelming when you're in that pain spiral and you can feel quite depressed and down and, and feel like you are in a hole that you can't get out of. Um, but there are things you can do that can make a really big difference. So it's important, I think, for people to feel empowered. One, one, one more comment, if I can. With the advent of more telemedicine and items uh, under the Medicare Act providing support for that, I think there's been, happily for those people who are away from centres or can't get there, we do have a shift and we are able to get access. And we're talking to North, Northern Tasmania here, for instance. Well, we can talk face to face with a clinician and you can, I guess, seek out the appropriate uh, assistance uh, more than you could have perhaps uh, two years ago, actually. Thank you. And I'm going to come to you in a moment for a, a new question. But Milton Cohen, if I could just come to you, I'm getting the message from Sophie Scott that if she applies herself to her overall well-being and, and her approach to thinking and to enjoying life, it can actually reduce the pain. Is that what we're saying tonight? How, how do you respond to that? Because I think of you as a doctor, as the man with the prescription pad, and I'm still interested to know when is medication the right way or an important way? And when is it, as Sophie's experiencing in her particular situation, not as significant as the other approaches to her overall well-being? Well, I heard Sophie say that she can get on with improving her function despite the pain, which means it hasn't actually gone away. It just sort of goes more into the background. At least that's what I interpret. Uh, she, she, may, she, she may have said, because she's concentrating on other aspects apart from the unpleasantness of the sensation of pain. Now, that's the result of a lot of learning, a lot of study on her part as well as therapeutic input. But then to come back and address the point you just made, which is really a question, is there a role for medicines in this context? The answer is yes, there is. We do have quite powerful medicines available, but they've got to be used cleverly. And it's really important in using medicines to treat pain, chronic non-cancer pain in particular, to answer one question, is this person's pain responding to this medicine? And if it's not responding, well, then you don't persist with that medicine. You might try another one asking the same question. But medicines like that are only ever an adjunct to the other aspects of management we've been talking about. So they will take the edge off the unpleasantness of it, which might, it might allow more brain space, as it were, to concentrate on the pacing, on improving function, on addressing some of the social factors. So it's a careful balance of tailoring the medicines, just as you tailor your exercise program to the individual situation. You tailor your medicines to the individual situation, asking specific questions. Are you trying to take 
Are you going in for symptom control? Are you trying to dampen the nervous system in some way without dampening the patient? But always asking the question, is this working? And one of the reasons which we've got into a bit of trouble in recent times uh, and why certain medicines are in bad odour at the moment is simply because that question wasn't being asked appropriately. It's so interesting. If I could just say, as a cancer patient, my primary treating doctor, he modified my medications almost every 48 hours. It, it was a, an intense monitoring of me uh, and, and constant adaption. Uh, 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 again, there's that sense of a real intensity of focus and, and, uh, and support that isn't necessarily available to the average uh, patient. But Catherine, you've been nodding madly. We, we, we're coming into that last 10 minutes of the session and I'm wondering, are there key messages you would like to reinforce? Because a lot of people have been talking about psychology. Yes, absolutely. I mean, I think um, Sophie's point about focusing on what it is that you would like to be able to achieve is really important. And if you can gather around you um, health professionals who are happy to work with you towards your goals, uh, rather than purely trying to change the pain, then I think you're definitely going in the right direction. And certainly with, with uh, clients that I've worked with in the past, when we've talked about their use of pain medication, I've kind of tried to encourage them to put it in that context. So if in five years time, someone suddenly says to them, you know, we've got this amazing new medication that we think might be good for you, to have a think in advance about, okay, well, what would this pain medication need to give me to make it worthwhile me continuing to take it and what are the things that would make me think I should just not pursue this because maybe it's giving me a side effect that I, I don't like or it's getting in the way of me doing something um, rather than enhancing my life so I think that that can be really helpful and I think the other thing I would just like to follow up on is that that issue of uh people worrying that the clinicians around them are treating them as though their pain is imaginary if they suggest seeing a psychologist. What, I guess what I would say in relation to that it is an important thing to bear in mind is that um, our pain system is a pretty blunt tool. You know, it's a way of signaling something to us that it that needs attention. It tells us nothing about what that thing is that needs attention it's so it's really like that car alarm analogy is a great one you know the alarm's going off but you've got no idea what's wrong you just know that there is some kind of a problem um, and so anywhere in the incredibly complex system that we are as human beings can contribute to that eventual one little well not necessarily all that little but that that one perception of pain and that perception of pain is a combination of all the different things that come in. So, you know, there are lots of different things that can contribute to then unpicking that. Uh, and psychology is, is just one, but it's it's an important part for everybody, I think. Tim, I'll give you a chance for key points in a minute, but I want to see if we can get one more question in before the end. Alan, do you have another topic to raise? Well, at least three people have asked the question. Is it possible to explore an alternative to assessing pain on a scale of one to 10? Tim, can I come to you on that? <laughs> you look very responsive. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll happily answer that because I hate it personally. Uh, I really struggle with it. Um, it. Look, it is really difficult. Uh, sometimes people who struggle with it struggle with it because they think that's going to be compared to somebody else. And sometimes when you say to them, look, it's just your number and uh, and if, if your number changes, that's all that matters. And sometimes that helps people. Um, but, uh, but coming back to what Catherine said uh, and, and Milton too, uh, any intervention that we use, uh, we really should say, has it helped the patient achieve you know, their functional goals in life? And, and if, we viewed, if we viewed medications that way, if we viewed exercise that way, if we viewed seeing a psychologist that way, I, I think that would really help rather than bringing everything back to whether my pain score dropped. Um, the research is still littered with trials to say, did my pain score dropped? Uh, and, and they often, they, they change by about that much, but often patients say, uh, like Sophie, 
uh, my pain's still there, but it just doesn't bother me as much. Now, that, that is a hard sell, as we said from the beginning. So we have to go right back to affirming with people what's there. Uh, on, on another note, we never give up trying to assist people to change their pain experience. Um, but we'll, we'll certainly uh, try and assist them to, to, to sort of see that that's not the only thing that they actually want. I'll say one last little point from me. Um, we're all psychologists, just not with a capital P. Uh, there, there's an abundant literature about the fact that every interaction we have in life has a psychology to it. Um, any of their relationships, all of us have, have a psychology behind them. And so uh, what, what we all need to be doing is to be doing the right psychology with people. And if we give people poor advice, then there's a psychology behind giving them poor advice. And so psychology is not just about whether people are anxious or depressed or those big, horrible words that make us scared. Um, it's about knowledge. It's about empowerment. It's, it's about uh, feeling threatened. It's, it's about so many different things that are just fundamental to us understanding our world and understanding how we can get better. Thank you. <laughs> There's a bit of clapping going on there. So, can I ask you, how do you communicate with the people you work with clinically about how your pain level is going? If one to 10 is inadequate, do your, your reflections there? Um, look, I think it comes down to, fun I, I, I go back to the thing about how well you're able to function and do the things that you really want to do. Because pain, pain is a very subjective experience. Um, certainly when I'm I'd say, you know, the, the more severe end of the spectrum pain that I have is a, is a migraine, which severely impacts my ability to function. So when I'm in the throes of a migraine, I do have to throw medication at it. Um, but, um, but when it became chronic, then I sought the help of a neurologist who specialised in migraine and who, who was able to help me track what was going on um, and look at triggers and so look at again look at it much more holistically than just you're in pain take a painkiller you'll feel crappy and you'll get over it so looking at that bigger picture and that that really helped as well so um yes on those days i probably would if you if you were saying it out of a sort of one to ten it would be probably you know bad but you also the mindset of knowing it's not going to last forever can help as well and then re recognizing that the medication that I have to take for those does have really bad side effects for me. So I can't really function the next day. So I need to sort of think, okay, I'm going to have to take the medication the next day. I'm not going to be able to function that well, but, um, and just build that into your schedule as well. So, and recognizing that, you know, there are, you know, particularly for migraine um, sufferers that, you know, it's again, you know, if you're tired, stressed, overworked, um, all these other things, and you do suffer an ongoing condition like migraines, you're probably more likely to have them if you're in those states than, than on a nice holiday somewhere. So it's, again, um, recognising that, um, you know, these conditions don't exist in a vacuum. They exist within our whole life experience. And, um, and, and there are things that people can do about it, though, to feel better. And that's, I think, we want people to take away the message of hope that there are things you can do uh, in your daily life to, to feel better. And even though it might take a while, like it did for me to accept that, because we all want the quick fix, all of us, that's human nature. Um, but sometimes, you know, it's not always going to happen like that. And so um, you can still feel well, despite having some levels of pain. And, and yes, feeling empowered and feeling like you're doing something to help can make a big difference, I think, in that. Thank you again, Sophie, for your contribution this evening. I, just before I hand over to Alan, as we're approaching the end of our session, Milton Cohen, what are, are there a couple of messages you'd like people to remember out of today, that this evening's discussions that you think are very important, or any other point you'd like to add? I think we've covered really the main ones, uh, Julie. I mean, the, the three dimensions, the bio, psycho and social dimensions really are very important. Uh, and the new knowledge about how the nervous system can change and signaling pain is also very important. And I guess the third would be that medicines can be useful if they're used well and properly, but they're only ever an adjunct to education uh, physical approaches, psychological approaches, and as has been mentioned many times, the interaction between the clinician and the patient is really 
key there. Look, I'm just going to give you one minute on a really simple question is, you've got the word physician in your title, haven't you? Yes. Well, there aren't many generalists. I often, th you know, what strikes me in what we've talked about tonight is you need a doctor with a, a, a big picture approach. And I feel like when you're a, a kid, you've got paediatricians. And then when you're old, you can get geriatricians. But in that middle, everything becomes sliced into specificity. Whereas I need you, I need a complex physician. Is, is, so our people go, right. are the new doctors coming in to, t to fill your shoes? Well, we're, we're training as many specialist pain medicine physicians as funding will allow. Well, that's and, uh, so we, and, the, so the, and the term is specialist pain medicine physician, which really means, it, it, it now means those who take a holistic view, basically. We're not the only specialty that takes a holistic view, but in the context of pain, that is still relatively new, we're doing our best to train as many as possible. Well, that's good. That comes in with hope, Sophie, doesn't it? Because you've been on about that all night, which I'm grateful for. Um, ladies and gentlemen, we're heading. I'm a great believer in finishing on time. So I want to say thank you for uh, allowing me to host. And I want to hand over to my friend with this tremendous moustache, Dr. Alan Chell. Uh, thank you. Look, uh, I'm sure that many people listening tonight have got a good GP looking after them. Um, I'm sure many colleagues, you know, it said that GPs have to have a handle on about 150 different conditions when the person walks through the door. So you're quite right, having specific uh, knowledge is very helpful and having experience obviously helpful. So I think that there are many GPs out there who can be of great help. And I think it's important to accept that we need that multidisciplinary team uh, in this management of chronic conditions. Um, and that's for not only for pain, but obviously for others as well. So I want to also thank very much all of the panellists here, Catherine, Sophie in particular, Tim, absolutely, and Milton, thank you very much for Northern Tasmania. Um, and, and of course, to Jessica, and, and, and please remember that we will be providing with the resources that were mentioned tonight in an email that will come back to those people registered, as well as a survey, because we love your feedback, including our panellists, to let us know how we did. And that the next session we're going to be having is in the realms of what's happening now, the vaccination rollout. So we're going to talk about vaccines and hesitancy about having a vaccination Wednesday, the 5th of May, another Zoom evening. And um, we want to say, look, thank you very much to Julie, who's as always a fantastic host and compare and moderator and, uh, and a good friend of WALPA. And to know that WALPA Hospital, which has become really a number one rehab uh, support post-op for including myself for a hip and a knee and I can tell you they're very painful but when you do the exercise the pain slowly dissipates so we have a very multidisciplinary team also at WALPA uh, and we have a move well program amongst many for the local people and helping people get through that difficult thing called post anything pain mm. so thank you very much and I wish you all to stay well stay healthy and when we all get vaccinated be COVID free for quite a long time so and thank you. Go ahead. Thank you, Alan. Just before we, our, our Michael man uh, says goodbye to us, technically, Catherine, a dog has entered the building. I've got to see. Now, we haven't mentioned, if you could just turn on your microphone, seriously, the role of pets in emotional well-being. And I think Sophie's... Absolutely. Really Can you, my... introduce your, you introduce your dog? I'll just get my Bruno. <laughs> this is CJ who is a Havanese, the national dog of Cuba. <laughs> yeah, buenos dias, buenos tardes. Yeah, uh, I've got Bruno and Sophie, you've got a dog. Hello, Bruno. Now, evidently some people like wow, cats. Wow, look at that. Oh, what's your dog's name? This is, this is Sammy. Oh, uh, Sammy. Uh, oh, there's another one. Him. Well, I'll just have to suffice with a moustache, that's all. <laughs> Julie and I are desperate to get Bruno and Sammy in the same room one day. I hope someone's taking a photo. Well, you are, photo. you are, you are, yes. Tim, what's your dog's name? Yeah. Casper. Oh, cute. He's getting a little bit old. Well, look, seriously, there is a role for pets in emotional... Uh, uh, Milton, do you have a pet when you're not in Northern Tasmania? 
Uh, sadly not, uh, Julie, no. Well, look, there are plenty of cavoodles available to you. <laughs> So, um, thank, thank you. you. <laughs> anyway, that happy scene, I'm going to say thank you very much. Oh, and the cat. Hello, cat. <laughs> to be, thank you. Stay well, stay healthy. And to everybody out there, we appreciate you being online with us until the next time. Yes. All the best from Wapa Hospital. Thanks, Bye. everyone. Bye. Bye. <laughs> Cameras off, please. Thanks. Thanks, everybody. Fantastic. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.